The Lord has given me this message called Invited. And um, I want you to know y'all are invited, amen? Everyone that's here, you have been invited. We've all been given an invitation, an invitation to enter into the presence of the King. Not everyone will say yes, but God's given everyone a choice, amen? You have a choice whether you want to encounter the king or not. See, God loves us with an unconditional love. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Amen? Amen? But not everybody's going to choose to follow him, to lay down their life and actually follow him. And so we've been given a choice, an invitation. And this morning you have a choice to accept that invitation or to reject that invitation. Amen? See, we have to recognize that God wants to change our lives. He does not want us to stay the same. Living in him, we will have peace. We will have joy. We will have love. But living Living outside of God, there'll be hurt, there'll be pain, there'll be death. And so we have a choice this morning whether to live for him or to live outside of him. We have a choice. God's given every single one of us a choice. Amen. And so we have to recognize that we have a choice. Look at your neighbor and say, you have a choice. Now go with me to Matthew 22. And we're going to start with verse 1. And Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Matthew 22, verse 1. It says, Jesus also told them, the, the, told them other parables. He said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited. But they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them, The feast has been prepared. The bulls and fattened cattle have been killed. And everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But the guest he had invited ignored them and went their own way. One to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. And the king was furious, and he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready. Everybody say, the wedding feast is ready. And the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad. Everybody say good and bad. And the banquet hall was filled with guests. Verse 11 says, but when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 14 says, for many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. So I want to talk about this wedding feast today because we see many things happening here. First, you have to see at the beginning, the king has sent out invitations you know, if, you're, if you've ever been invited to a wedding, you don't get it on the same day. You don't get invited the same day the wedding is going to be uh, happening. They send you that invitation weeks in advance. Why? So that you can make a preparation to come. And see, this king had sent out the invitations. And those that were called, that were invited, refused the invitation when the day came. There was no honor and no reverence to enter into the king's presence. See, we can get so caught up with the many distractions that are happening in our life that we neglect when the king is calling. 
You are the invited. When the king summons you, you have to accept that invitation and come to him. But many refuse it. Many get so busy. And what did, what did we just read? They said, no, you know, I've got to go do this. I've got to take care of my business. I've got to do these things. And so we get so caught up doing things that we miss out and we actually refuse when the king is calling. We don't know how to drop what we're doing because the king is calling. Amen. We can come up with every excuse. We can come up with so many excuses. You know, so many churches in America this morning are empty. When the king is calling, they get so busy for him. They want, they want God, but they just want a little bit. Only when they need him. Only when they're going through something. Then they come to him. And see, we have to be in his presence continually. That when we have a need, he already knows and he's right there in front of us that we don't have to ask. It's already done. And so you've been given an invitation. You, You know, you know what the king has for you in his kingdom is good. You know it's, you know, you, you know when you've been invited to a really good wedding? You know the food's going to be good. You know the atmosphere is going to be good. And you can't wait to go. Cassie, make sure it's good, okay? <laughs> but you know, everything has been done. All you have to do is show up. And see, sometimes we have tasted of God and we know that he's good. But we get busy with other things. We get busy with our lives. Yes, we want to give God, you know, praise, but we only want to do it whenever things are good. We can't praise him when we're going through stuff. We get upset. Why isn't God answering? See, when you're in his presence, you know that you have his ear. And so we have to, you know, there's, there's a, quite a few things that you have to judge yourself. You have to see where, you, where you're at here. I'm showing you what the Word of God says, and I got so overwhelmed just studying this because it was so good. <laughs> but what happened was, as we read, the king sent the servants, to go and bring them in, those that he had invited, and they all refused to come. So what happened? Again, the king sends out another group of servants to go and bring them in and tell them, look, I've I've killed the cow. I've done everything. All you have to do is come and celebrate with me. And what did they say? I'm busy. I have to do this. I have to do that. I don't have time. And so not only... Did they not have time to enter into the presence of the king? But they killed the messengers that were sent. See, we cannot get too religious where we say, stop praising him that much. Because when you enter into the, into the presence of the king, you know that the atmosphere is changing. You know something in you is changing. You don't know what that person has gone through. Just because you're stagnant right now, you have to stir yourself up. You have to get to that place where it's not a common thing to be in his presence. You have to stir yourself up and know it's not an ordinary thing to be in his presence. You are in the presence of the king. Don't ever let it become common in your life. When we come to church, are you expecting to receive? Are you just allowing it to be, check, I did my duty. He wants you. 
He wants your presence, not just your body. He wants your presence. He wants you to be present as he is calling you to him. Because you can think, you could be sitting here and thinking, did I leave the coffee pot on? Or my frijol is burning? (laughs) What's for lunch? What time is she going to be done? You know, your mind can be everywhere but here. And you can miss out on what God wants to do and speak to you right at this moment. See, many times we we end up going in circles and going in circles and going in circles because we don't know how to be still before his presence. We don't know how to be still and just know, just hear. And so we have to know that when we are invited into the presence of the king, we are invited to honor him to be before him, to partake of everything he's, he's prepared for us, everything Jesus did on that cross. Amen. And so they destroyed the messengers. And those messengers remind me of those soul winners. Those going out and declaring the feast is ready. The banquet is ready. The king is calling you. Come on in. Come enter in. And you know, people can deny you. They can, they can say things about you. They can beat you. They can do all these things to you. But it was the king who came to their protection. It was the king who avenged them. So you don't have to fight the battle. When you're, when you're part of the kingdom, the king fights for you. Amen? And so we see that death came to those that refused the messengers. Death came to those that killed the messengers. Hmm. And so what happened as we keep reading... Verse 7, it says, the king was furious and he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready and the guests I invited are not worthy of the honor. Now go out to the streets and invite everyone you see. Hmm, mm mm-mm. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, the good and the bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. Hallelujah. See, God is looking for the one that's willing to come to him. And if you deny him, he'll find the one that's ready to come to him. And it says, the good and the bad. You don't get to judge who comes in. Because the king said, bring those that are good and bring those that are bad. That means everyone was in that banquet hall. Those that you didn't like, those that you, you know, did things to you. You looked across the room and oh my goodness, what is she doing here? You didn't get to have a say so. Because you could have ran from the kingdom or you could have received what the king had for you. See, I always find this funny. People stop coming to church because they don't like who's in the church. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? Excuse me, God, I can't be there because Pastor Hannah's there. Can I just go to my room? Can I go worship in my room? Like, what are you going to tell God? What are you going to tell them? Because if you can't do it here on earth, you're not going to do it in heaven. If you cannot forgive those that have hurt you, and if you can't have a compassion and a love for them, not judging, because, and I'm sorry I'm picking on you, Pastor Hannah. I love you. You know that. But if I say, no, Pastor Hannah was talking about me. She's been spreading rumors about me. She's been doing, what, you know, what is she even doing there? The king has called her. The king, not you, the king has called her. 
See, and because your eyes are on her, sorry again, because your eyes are on her, you will miss what the king wants to give you. You will miss it. There's going to be people in heaven that you're going to say, what? We will all know where Reuben will be. <laughs> but you have to understand that he's calling everyone to him. And he's sending his messengers to go and bring them in. Not the ones that you think need to be here. Because sometimes the ones that you think need to be here are the very ones that are refusing the invitation. Hallelujah. And you might be the one that says, well, I'm the bad one. Well, you know what? He's still calling you in. Because something happens when you enter into the kingdom of God. Change begins to happen as you draw close to him. See, it's not your past. It's not what you've done. It's not how good you are. It's, you know, it's none of those things that determine whether the king will call you. It's those that have an open heart, those that are hungry to receive what the king has for them. You got to stay hungry. You got to stay hungry. Hallelujah. See, there, there's, there's something... We want to judge ourselves and we want to say, well, you know what? I live this kind of life and I got to clean myself up before I come to him. No, he's calling you just the way you are. But there's something that happens and we're going to get into it right now. But he's calling those that will come. Those that will come to the wedding feast. Those that will come and partake with the king has already prepared. You got to come. You have to come. And as you're here, and as you're, you know, in the kingdom, and as you're, you're looking around, you're going to see. You know what's so awesome? He calls a sinner. And, you know, the sinner, the beggar, The adulterer, he calls them. And you know, those names identify who you are. Because a sinner will sin. That's who they are. But when he calls them, he changes their clothes. And they're no longer labeled according to what this world has labeled them. He's put on some new garments, amen? He's put on new things. So, you know, you might be here today and you might feel like you're totally unworthy, like you lived a bad life and, you know, there's things that you've done that God can't forgive you. No, he's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you to him, amen? He's calling you because he's about to do something so awesome and so great in your life that people are going to see you and they're going to say, what happened? What changed? How did this happen? because you used to be the one always asking, always begging, always broken, always addicted and now you're happy and you're joyous and you keep talking about this Jesus. He's calling you. Huh. Hallelujah. See, the servants knew what was happening in the kingdom. They knew because they lived there. They lived in the kingdom. So they knew what the king had prepared. You can only tell others based on what you've seen and experienced.
I can tell you that I love to eat steak because I've tasted it. <laughs> I've tasted it and I love it and I go and I partake every time that I can. Now you all want steak, right? <laughs> it's not coming right now. <laughs> but I'm, I'm showing you something. Because you can only tell about those things that you've experienced. You can't set other people free without knowing that Jesus has set you free. You can't tell others that there's joy in Jesus because unless you've experienced the joy, because you went from a state of depression to a state of constant joy. See, you can only tell others, say, come, come, because you know it's available, because you know it's there. Come on. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Some of you have shown up, but you've never tasted you sit and you watch others taste and you watch others, you know, partake of this amazing feast that the king has prepared. But you've never tasted. And he's telling you, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the minute that you partake of the very word, the very things that are in front of you, freedom comes in. Victory begins to set in. Your life is changed. You cannot stay the same when you are in the presence of the king. You cannot stay the same when you grab a hold of this manna, of this bread that God has given us and begin to taste and begin to partake. It changes you. See, we can, we can live all our lives in church and nothing will change. It's not the church. It's the word that needs to get into you. Some of you, you've grown up in church and it's become very common. You go to church and then you live how you want to live. Not remembering that you're in the kingdom. See, you could stay the same on the outside, but something is changing on the inside. When you eat, and I don't know why I keep going back to food. Maybe I'm hungry. <laughs> but when you eat, you cannot see what's happening to the food on the inside. You don't know how it's being digested and what's happening. You can't see it with your physical eyes, but you know it's happening. And see, it's the same with the word. Every time you digest it, every time you eat of it, something is happening in the spirit realm. Something is changing in your spirit. You might not be able to see it. Other people may not be able to see it, but they will see the fruits of it. Hallelujah. You have to stay hungry and you have to heed the call. You have to heed the call. You know, you, you, when you show up, you can't walk out because somebody else showed up that you didn't like. You know, we've all been to that wedding that somebody shows up and you just, uh-uh, I'm leaving. You don't get to do that with God. I mean, you can, but it'll be to your detriment. It'll be to your death. So keep your eyes on the king. Show up. Partake of what he's prepared for you. Amen? Hallelujah. Say, I need to be hungry. Look at your neighbor and say, I need to be hungry. Hallelujah. So you can either be the one who refuses the invitation or the one who accepts the invitation. You can be the one that says, yes, I'm coming. Yes, I'll be there. Or you can be the one that's just so busy and you don't have enough time and you're making up every excuse of why you can't be there. Let's go to verse 11. Hallelujah. 
It says, but when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. So, verse 12 says, friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? Now, I want you to see this. Because the king called for those that were on the streets, those that were on the highway, the byway, under the bridge, those that were in the corners, those that were on the streets. So, of course, they didn't have the proper wedding attire. Guess who provided it? The king provided the proper wedding attire for his guests. There was nothing that they had to do. All they had to do was show up. See, he takes our filthy rags of sin. He takes these things that we've been wearing for so long. And he says, I've given you a new garment, a garment of salvation, a garment of righteousness. He provides it, but we still have to choose to put it on. And that's what we see here. There was a man who had, the king had provided everything he needed to enter into the kingdom. He provided the right clothes, the right wedding attire, and the man decided not to put them on. And when the king saw him, he said, friend, how is it that you've come in here without the proper clothes? Now, what is the proper clothes? Go with me to Isaiah 61. Because I want you to see that God is the one who provides. It's like, there's nothing you have to do. Show up. And sometimes we don't even want to show up. Isaiah 61 verse 10. It says, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God. For he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation. And drape me in the robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewels. So what it is, he's provided salvation. He's provided righteousness. And now you can come into the wedding feast because now you have the proper attire, which is salvation, salvation and righteousness. Or you can be the one that shows up and decides not to put it on because you want to come and do things your way. You can tell the Lord, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And you can still show up. He's going to say, why aren't you dressed correctly? And you'll have no excuse, just like this man. There was no excuse. He had no excuse for the king. He just said, So what did the king do? Tie him up and throw him out. See, you have to choose to accept the clothes that God has provided for you. Salvation belongs to you. Jesus purchased it on the cross. Righteousness belongs to you. What does righteousness righteousness mean? Right standing before God without sin upon your life. See, you can stand before the Lord clean because of what Jesus did. He doesn't see your filthy rags anymore. He sees the robe. He sees the garment of salvation upon your life. That's who he is. Hallelujah. Salvation doesn't mean just being saved from from hell. Salvation is wholeness. It means to be saved, to be healed, to be restored, to be delivered. It's not just saved. Saved from all those things. So when you accept Jesus, when salvation enters your life, now you can stand in wholeness. Now you can stand healed. Now you can stand delivered. Now you can stand redeemed. See, we don't, we don't play church. I'm not here to give you just a good message. I'm here to show you the way. 
I'm here to tell you about the goodness of God because he loves you so much. All these things are available to you. He's invited you. He sent you the invitation. But you have to accept it. Because I can tell you all these things, oh, it'll go great for you. Don't worry. You don't have to change. You don't have to do anything. It's not what the word says. And I got to tell you what the word says. I can't deviate from that. Hallelujah. So when you accept salvation, when you accept what Jesus did on the cross for you, you are accepting everything that was purchased on the cross for you. And so you might be feeling sick. You might have gotten a bad report. All these things might have come against you. Maybe, you know, you're battling with things in your life right now. But as long as the truth of the word of God enters in, then you overcome those things, not because of who you are, but what Jesus did for you. Just because you don't see it with your physical eyes doesn't mean it's not happening. Faith believes what it cannot see. Amen. Amen. And you can't buy these clothes. You can't earn these clothes. You just have to show up and receive them. You don't have to clean yourself up to come. Many people say, well, I've got these issues in my life. I'm going through these things. Come, just enter in, and you'll see what the Lord has prepared for you. You'll see that he's already made a way for you. He is the one who cleans you up. He is the one who dresses you, amen? He's the one who's already done it. You just have to show up. You just have to say, I'm right here. I'm willing to go. I'll go into the kingdom. You know, the king is calling me. Let me come. That's all it takes. And so you'll see that the king has already provided these things. But now I want to tell you what you got to do. Go with me to Colossians. Hallelujah. See, there's, there's these garments that the king has provided for you. But there's some things that we have to take off. And I'm going to read a little bit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, Colossians 3, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when, and when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Verse 5, it says, so put to death. Everybody say, put to death. Put to death. The sinful earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, a worship worshiping the things of this world because of these sins the anger of God is coming you used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world but now everybody say but now now. is the time to get rid of anger rage malicious behavior slander and dirty language don't lie to each other for you have been stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds Put on. Everybody say, put on. on. Say it again. Your new nature. And be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Verse 12, it says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself. You must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, 
kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Look at your neighbor and say patience. Make allowance. Listen, verse 13. Make allowance for each other's faults. And forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always, everybody say always, always. be thankful. See, there are some things that we have to put to death. There are some things that we have to choose to put down. Amen. Amen. Yes, I'm getting in your Kool-Aid this morning. You cannot make excuses for bad behavior. The more you make excuses, the more you stay the same. And so we've learned that if we have entered into the kingdom, if we are saved, then there is a new nature that we must put on. Letting go of the old ways. The old ways will lead you back to the old life. So there's some things that we have to put on. And that is where your character is developed. That is where your spiritual maturity happens. That's where you become unoffendable. An offended heart has a very hard time receiving from the Lord. An offended heart is, is a hard heart. And a hard heart has a hard time letting things in. And that's why you can come into the presence of God and you can, you can be where the atmosphere of God is, but you're still, you still feel on the outside. There's a reason. And many times it's offense. Not always, but many times. Because we've allowed the things or others to hurt us. And we've held on to those things we can't forgive. But we just read where the word of God says, forgive others as I, God, has forgiven you. See, if you're still caught up in what happened last year, last month, last week, 10 years ago, if that is still affecting your life, then it's time you let that go. Because it's affecting you. It's causing you to have a hard heart where you can't hear from God. If, how do you know if you're still offended? Somebody's asking that. <laughs> I tell you. If you can look at the person and see nothing but what Jesus sees. Amen. Some of you need to look at your neighbor <laughs> and just say, Lord, show me what you see. <laughs> When you can think of that person and it no longer affects you. That's how you know you're free from it. But if, you, if that person comes into your mind or somebody says their name and immediately you feel your blood pressure just... That means you haven't forgiven. That means you haven't let it go. And the only person it's affecting is you. And so you got to choose to let those things go. Love like he loved. Put on your new nature. Be patient with others. He's been patient with you. See, we want, we want, and sometimes we're, hard, we're the hardest on the ones we love. We, we want them, you know, to be a certain way. And we get frustrated when they're not. And we get impatient when they're not. But yet we extend that patience, patience to others. Why can't we do it to the ones we love? Especially to the ones we love. Especially to the ones in the body of Christ. Somebody messed up, 
Go be an encourager. Be the one that brings them back in. Be the one that reminds them of truth. Not the one that, that sits there and judges and says, you well, you're down. I'm going to kick you when you're down because you should have known better. Like we've never messed up. Awfully quiet, guys. <laughs> See, you can be the one that's always criticizing. But as, as we've read, whatever you give, <laughs> you shall receive it. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Can you let things just like slide off of you? See, you, you have to. You, you have to. Because if not, what it is, it's a chain that binds you. And then somebody else and co comes, you know, the enemy knows how to attack. He knows the things that trigger you. He knows the things that annoy you. He knows the very things that will cause you to have a hard heart. And so what does he do? He makes sure that there's people that are going to come into your life to do those things. Pastor Carlos used to say it's sandpaper. <laughs> Smoothing out the edges off of your life. Those areas that need to be molded and shaped. And so we have to allow these things, you know, when we enter into the kingdom, we have to see that we have to choose not to be angry. We have to choose not to talk the way we've always talked when we were in the world. We have to choose forgiveness, but it is love that binds everything together because without love, we can't do any of it. Your prayers have to be motivated by love. They cannot, you know, many times people pray out of anger. Nobody here, those watching on TV, praying for you. But sometimes people get so angry at other people that their prayers end up prayers of anger and not of love. Our prayers have to be motivated by love. Because God is love, amen? Love is not an emotion. Love is not um, conditional. Love is not the goosebumps you feel. The butterflies in your stomach. That's not love. God is love. Not God has love. God is love. And so when you've experienced the love of the Father, you are able to give that love to others. You are able to forgive others. You are able to have mercy upon others. But it's only until you experience it because human love says, you did that to me, uh-uh, goodbye. I'm done. I check out. That's human love. But the love of God has no condition. The love of God calls everyone who is good and bad into his kingdom. Amen? That's the love of God. Amen. First Peter 2.9 says, But you're not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Amen. You are not like everyone else. See, when you come into the kingdom of God, he changes your clothes. Yes. And you have to see yourself the way God sees you. Amen. And you are set apart to represent him. You are set apart to represent the love of the Father, the sacrifice of the Son, and the power of His Spirit here on earth. Amen. Amen. You are called by Him for Him, and you'll only fulfill your purpose through Him. Amen. You know, hallelujah. It's so awesome because the Lord has set you apart. And that's probably why you feel like you don't fit in anywhere. Because his hand is upon you. And there's things that you, you are around that you know God doesn't want you there. There are relationships that God has freed you from. 
but you're still thinking about them. There are things that God has set you free from, but as long as your mind goes back there, that's where you'll end up. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So wherever your thoughts take you, that's the direction your life will go. And so you have to recognize you are set apart. You are called by God. His hand is upon you. The Holy Spirit anointing is upon you. You shall do great and mighty works through the Holy Spirit. But as long as you see yourself clothed in the rags of sin, then you'll never be who God has called you to be. As long as you see yourself like everybody else, you'll never step into that very calling that God has called you to. And so we have to see, we are not like everybody else. We live in the kingdom of God. We are clothed with the garments of God, the garments that that the king has provided for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Romans 8, 29. It says, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. See, God is calling you to come to him. The king is calling you to come to him. But you have to respond to that call. You have to be the one that responds. You can make up every excuse and every excuse. But you know what? The Lord wants you just the way you are. Because he's got something else for you. And so we have to begin to see ourselves going to him. We have to see we are in the kingdom. We are not outside the kingdom. We have to see that all the benefits that the king has provided are available to us. But you have to come. God's chosen you. He's anointed you. He set you apart. He's put on his garments upon you. So you're not walking by yourself. You're not walking in your own ability. You're not walking in your own strength. You are walking with the power and authority that God has given you. So when you say, I can't do something, I can't. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You have to change your confession. You have to change what comes out of your mouth. Realize you are in the kingdom, so everything the kingdom has available to you is available to you. Amen? It's yours. It belongs to you. And so you have to be the one that either heeds the invitation or refuses the invitation. You have to be the, you know, the king calls you at all times. He'll wake you up at three in the morning to come to him. He'll wake you up at five in the morning. He'll call you in your lunch break. He'll call you as you're walking down the street. He'll call you at all times and in all, all moments. And you have to decide to, to come to him. You have to make that decision to come to him. Amen? We have to be bold. You know, um, speaking of boldness, before my husband left, you know, we, he, what did he command? Ten souls. Ten souls. Being bold with your faith and winning souls. And he prayed a spirit of boldness before he left upon the people. And I'm going to tell you, um, during Bible school, we had those moments where we were, we were doing a soul, a soul winning training. How many of you have, are in Bible school? Raise your hand. We did the soul winning training. And I'm going to tell you, it was so easy for them to win souls. That very night, I was getting reports of six-year-olds, eight-year-olds, adults, people of all ages winning souls, being the servants, the messengers that were calling those and bringing them into the kingdom. 
See, you're ne- it's not about your age. You could be five years old. You could be 105 years old. God is still going to use you. And so we are called to bring them in. We are called to go to the streets. We are called to go to the highway, the byway, under the bridge. We are called to go to the corner. We're called to go to those that are hurting, those that are broken. And bring them and tell them there's a banquet, there's a feast waiting for you. See, because you can, you can be the messenger, you can be the one that denies the call, or you can be the hurting that needs to be in that banquet. Or you can even be the one that's not dressed right. But Jesus said the kingdom of God is like this. And so we got to get our hearts ready. We got to go, you know, we have to be bold with our faith. We got to share our faith with others. We, you know, people are hurting. People are dying. Even in this room, you've been contemplating suicide. It's been that attack upon your life where you can't even sleep. But the power of God comes upon you to break every attack upon your life. Every hurt, every wound, everything you've gone through, the Lord knows how to come in and heal. Hallelujah.